In the mid-1800s, American cities were cramped, dirty, sprawling places, fueled by immigration and rapidly spreading outward. The cityscape at that time was different from what anyone now would think of as a large city. Skyscrapers were non-existent, and buildings were typically no more than three to four stories high, because anything higher would have been hard to access with stairs. Because the building height limit was kept to whatever could be accessed by stairs, space to build was quickly running out. Builders needed an alternative direction to construct buildings in, and the rise of the elevator gave them just that. The modern city and its panorama of high-rises would not be possible without the elevator. Um, certainly in urban conditions, elevator is essential. Um, as a matter of convenience in certain developments, I mean, it, it uh, it's desirable, um, and then as a matter of function, in some buildings it's necessary. Primitive hoists had been used to aid in construction since ancient times. The simple principle of a bucket attached to a manually pulled rope was the first predecessor of the modern elevator. Elevators up until, I guess, the 19th century um, were primarily used, obviously without power, uh, without electrical power, but with you know, human and, and animal power. Essentially, uh, they were used primarily for building things. In the Middle Ages, dumbwaiters, a primitive small load-bearing elevator, became common, and manual hoists were used to transport monks up and down cliffs in order to reach almost inaccessible cliff monasteries. Manual hoists continued to be used until the development of the hydraulic elevator in the early 19th century. Hydraulic elevators were functional, but their use was mainly limited to factories, so they did not have a big impact on skyscrapers. Their main downside was that to build a hydraulic elevator three stories high, a piston and cylinder would have to be installed three floors below ground level. The advent of the modern elevator came when inventor Elisha Otis constructed a crude elevator at the New York Crystal Palace Exposition during the World's Fair in 1854. This elevator was equipped with a safety, a device that would stop the elevator car from falling if the cable broke. That you know, act was really what allowed the public to feel more safe uh, in terms of using it. Elevators prior to that were used, again, primarily for conveying uh, materials and, and so forth, but they weren't really used to, to convey people. Otis's new elevator business quickly expanded due to their newfound publicity, and by 1857, Otis had installed 27 elevators in New York City, paving the way for the modern high-rise. Otis Elevator Company is still one of the world's leading elevator installers today. In 1880, German inventor Werner von Siemens developed a traction elevator powered by an electric motor underneath the car turning gears that carried the car upward by means of rails on the side of the shaft. In the next decade, elevators like this came into use, but they were not used in tall buildings. However, elevators powered by electricity were efficient and could be installed at low cost, so many people tried to think of a way to make electric elevators usable for high-rises. Soon, this problem was solved, because in 1903, the gearless traction elevator was developed. This model allowed for 100 plus story buildings to be accessible and had a huge impact on the urban landscape. The Woolworth Building, built in 1926, the tallest building in the world at its time at 787 feet, was entirely dependent on this elevator for its use. By World War II, elevators had reached their modern form and cities were becoming taller and taller as a result. The more, the more elevators you have, the more time you save, the more time you save, the more money that the uh, employer is able to make by getting the people to their workstations on time. The idea of, of urbanism with the advent of high-rises really changed. This elevator becomes almost like this enclosed street because you know, you're traveling with many, many more occupants than we would travel with in an elevator here in a low-density scenario. Like it, it's rare that I'll get on the elevator with, with someone in a two-story building. But if you're in a 70-story building or a 30-story building, um, people live there and they, they, they conduct business, you know, you're going you're to travel the elevator like you travel the streets or the subway. Another great contribution of elevators to modern high-rises is the construction process. 
Without the elevator, it would not be possible to even build a skyscraper. The workmen have to be delivered to the floors on which they're working uh, by the buckoys. And there are two buckoys. We use one of them certain times of the day for material only. And then when we load the, load the uh, building with manpower, we use both for, for the, the men. And then later on, we'll, we'll uh, utilize one buck hoist for personnel and the other one for uh, hoisting materials. Um, for buildings that are uh, concrete, um, elevators, very useful in, in getting you know, people and some materials up. And However, the rise of the Empire State Building in 1931 signaled another setback in the practicality of constructing tall buildings. In a high-rise the size of the Empire State Building, the dozens of elevator shafts needed to service the steady flow of workers and customers took away from the building's rentable space. Building a skyscraper any higher would not be economical because the empty elevator shafts would take up too much room. This conundrum was the reason that the Empire State Building remained the world's tallest building for roughly 40 years. No one could solve this problem until the World Trade Center was built. These buildings were one of the first to introduce the concept of sky lobbies and express elevators. This concept divided the building into three sections with one express elevator per section that traveled to one of the two sky lobbies. Two floors spread throughout the building built as a hub for local elevators that would take workers to select floors only. By doing this, a huge amount of space was saved and buildings were again free to sort of the skies. Unfortunately, those two towers no longer exist, but the concept of sky lobbies still does and is used in all of the world's tallest buildings today. These days, elevators have become a decorative item to flaunt, as well as a vital machine in the life of the skyscraper. Many elevators are clear and scenic, made out of transparent material, so that the passenger can see not only the inner workings of the elevator, but also the panorama of the modern city, made possible by the elevator. Some elevators completely break out of conventional design, such as the elevator at the Louvre in Paris, France, or the elevator at St. Louis Arch in Missouri. One highly unsafe kind of elevator, called the Paternoster, operates in some parts of Europe. This elevator does not stop, but keeps on going in an endless cycle like a Ferris wheel. Taipei 101 in Taipei, Taiwan contains 67 elevators including two that travel at 1,314 feet per minute, the world's fastest. A regular airplane will normally only climb or descend at a rate of about 1,000 feet per minute. Even though an elevator this fast is essential to a building so high, such fast elevators run into numerous problems, such as air pressure in the shaft, noise, and rupturing eardrums. Elevators have also opened up previously inaccessible places to millions of disabled people. A state law that says anything that's two floors or more has to have an elevator in it if it's going to be open to the handicapped public. Thanks to the elevator, people can travel swiftly and safely up high rises. Thanks to the elevator, people have a safe and easy way to defy gravity. Thanks to the elevator, skyscrapers continue to define the skyline of the modern city.